Licht, ein bisschen Licht. Meine Damen und Herren, es gibt Situationen, da ist der Festivaldirektor besonders stolz. Begrüßen Sie bitte mit mir Daniel Kimmann und Sadie Smith. So, the words Sadie Smith needs no introduction will not escape my lips. You all know why you're here. My friend, the brilliant novelist, essayist, and occasional singer Sadie Smith is in Berlin again, this time to introduce a very short book written in the first months of the COVID epidemic of 2020. Every reader will notice that it's a very personal book and it feels especially personal to this reader, actually personal to a surreal degree, because when COVID struck, Sadie and I lived in the same building. The streets, the French place, the old lady with the little dog, the legless man. Um, yeah, when I first read intimations, I thought, I know these places, I know these people. And the defamiliarizing effect of good writing was so strong that it took me a moment to realize that, yes, indeed, I knew them. Not because a great writer turns the individual into something recognizably universal, even though that's, of course, also the case, but because I actually was there at the same time when the pandemic hit New York City in a moment that already feels historic now. I even know that nail place you mentioned, even though I was not one of its customers. <laughs> we both saw that playground we had spent so much time on, often talking about new books while our children remained unattended on swings or broken little cars. We both saw it suddenly empty, like everything else, because the world had temporarily ended. And eventually we both left the city for a while at first and then for good. Intimations is a small book of great weight that brings back those strange, sad, horrifying days which now some people like to remember as a period of calm and introspection and clean air. But when it happened, it didn't seem particularly introspective to me and even the good air smelled of dystopia. A big applause, please, for one of the great writers of our time, back in Berlin. <laughs> so, um, I sometimes think that how people reacted to the world temporarily ending was somehow a test about how they felt about their lives before. And I was really sad, and I remember, and now I also have the book to prove it, so were you. So that means we did have quite a nice life, didn't we? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did. Though, I, I, I mean, personally, I don't know how, how you all felt, but I, I, I kind of look back with shame remembering the thing I was most uh, sad about was the idea of being locked in a room with my children. <laughs> now that I look back on that, I, I, feel, I find that quite shameful, like how panicked it made me, the idea that I wouldn't have, you know, nine till three each day to do the same thing I've been doing since I was 21. <laughs> so I, I witnessed a complete, complete panic, I think, and uh, despair. You were more positive in my memory. Was I? I was, I was so worried. I, I, I <clears throat> reread some of the emails we wrote. Uh, we meaning a, a small group of friends. Mm -hmm. You, Nick, uh, Harry, Katie, Valeria, Anna, my wife, and me. Uh, 
sorry, this is not going to be completely private. I'm, I'm just <laughs> apologize. A group but of writers. Yes, a group of writers. Know, yeah. A group of writers, which immediately makes it very interesting. <laughs> and um, actually, I had half forgotten how completely terrified we were, all of us, in March 2020 in New York City, which is, of course, important. It, it, it felt different in New York than it must have felt at that moment in most other places in the world. But uh, it really felt to us for a moment like the end of civilization was possible. Right. And I think each of us had a different, I mean, subject to our personalities, Hari Kunzru thought politically immediately. Yes. I just thought, I was just in existential despair. I was the most useless. If we were in a kind of end of the world zombie gang, <laughs> I was the one laid out on the bed, unable to <laughs> process even basic facts. You were Mr. Science. <laughs> I which was. I found intolerable. I didn't want to hear anything about science. <laughs> um, and Katie was calm and reasonable and thinking about practical things like what about schools, what about children, what about work. It was interesting, bits of our personalities which exist anyway, kind of um, magnified by the situation. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, remembering when I, when I looked at those emails again, uh, I also remembered some of the details of how the nightmare descended on us and uh, actually quite before the end of the world uh, we did an event together it was february 27 at the 92nd y you kindly introduced my novel oh, too yeah, yeah, yeah. and afterwards we times. joked we joked about it um in a bitter very worried but still not entirely serious way. We knew something would happen, but we, I mean, even though we knew something would happen, we still didn't quite believe in it, right? Or No, I mean, my impression was that of all the people ill-equipped to deal with the multifaceted emergency, writers were right up top there at the prime uselessness, just <laughs> totally incapable of understanding any element of it. Um, and I felt that uh, I felt that so strongly, the feeling of being useless, which, which I think is a general writer's feeling anyway, but it was intensified. Yeah, I remember on, on March 5, I looked up some of those things. Bef uh, on March 5, there was the big pen gala in New York. Oh and yes, uh, about 600 or so people in a crowded theater. And Seth Meyers, as the moderator, oh, yeah. actually saying, uh, only writers are so lonely and so unhappy at home that in the, that in the midst, what he thought of at that moment, at the midst of a pandemic, they would crowd together in a theater. And <laughs> right. it was a big laugh because, right. again, we thought this is a good joke because we didn't really think half of us would be sick or could be. No. It didn't, wasn't quite half of us, but we didn't really feel like it, it was as dangerous as it must have been. But there was also some element of it which was slightly troubling for writers that the, the part of life that everyone was dreading, being alone in your room, is our life. So you're being told yeah. basically that your normal existence is a traumatic thing to experience <laughs> day by day, which, which really struck me again when I was writing, that, that this thing everybody was complaining about was what I do normally. And that, <laughs> and that was partly, a, that's a problem. Like yeah, what I do normally is not, is not mentally healthy. You have a great essay about that in, 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 in Intimations, where you're basically saying the writers, the, the thing everyone is saying now, now being um, April 2020, uh, what am I going to do right. with my time, with the day? This is what the li writer's life always was like. And right. now suddenly everyone has the same problem. Everyone had the what same to problem. Do. But on the other hand, in, at least theoretically, writers have a great solution to the problem that most other people don't have, which is right. we actually like, I mean, most of us kind of uh, like writing. Yeah, but, but that, was, that was in that moment, it was, it was gone like I normally try and, I don't know, preserve some part of my brain from the speed of the news cycle or whatever, but that was all gone. I, I was just in front of the television in my case, day and night. I was, de I was, my mind was in that place. I was on the internet every five seconds, which I'm, I'm not normally, and I was also, dealing with that strange time delay between America and Europe, where my family mm -hmm. in London thought it was a joke, basically. 
and that we were exaggerating mm -hmm. and it was ridiculous. And that kind of extended over the months when you realized that, I mean, in my case, parts of my family were never going to get vaccinated, still aren't vaccinated. So it was a series of, you know, personal debates, political debates, understanding gaps. Um, I found all of that uh, incredibly uh, impossible to write through, impossible to think through. So when I, when I started this book, it was just a way of trying to find another way to think, like not the way I was thinking at that time, which was like, a, I don't know, somebody continually, momentarily triggered by every second of the news. Which is, but you did find that way to write. I didn't find that for, I didn't experience it, as I said, as, as, as some people now like to say, or as some people also actually did, of course, experience it as a period of introspection and good focus and great time for writing. I wasn't able to write at all, and you were actually able to write but this. But for, for me, it was the opposite way around. It was like the opposite revelation, because normally, it's not that I'm some kind of monk, but I'm not online in, in that way every second. So for the period, it was kind of like a revelation. Oh, this is what it's like. This mm -hmm. is how people live all the time. This is how their brains are. Mm -hmm. And I, I found it really um, stressful. And it was a real revelation to what it's like to feel the responsibility to think at that speed and to, th and to allow other people's thoughts to be your thought day and night. And that's, that's kind of how it was. I was watching the news, I was listening to the president, I was refreshing the screen every three seconds and I thought, I feel like I'm going crazy. And then a, a month of that, I really began to think, okay, if this is how people's minds are working normally, even not in a pandemic, this is the speed that they're living at. Is there a way to, to write to slow them down? That was really the only intention, like to slow myself down again and to try and remind myself that there are other ways to think. And the model for that was Marcus Aurelius, wasn't, wasn't he? Yeah, it just happened to be in the room I was in. It was kind of, I was lying on a sofa whacked out with the depression and it was on the shelf, so I thought, oh, you know give it a shot. And what struck me about him, not that it's a new idea, obviously it's an ancient idea, but the original principle of his kind of philosophy and those kind of essays is that the mind is communicating with other parts of the mind. It's mm -hmm. a discussion with oneself. You're thinking one thing, you're countering that thought. And I thought it's the very opposite of what I've been doing those past few months, which was uh, communicating with millions of people or letting that basically is what your internet relation is, or letting the thoughts of millions of people mm -hmm. enter my mind. I, I wanted an escape from it. And also the voice of the internet, which I had forgotten, it can sometimes feel like it's just one person typing. You can read all over, you can go everywhere, you can see everything, but there's a kind of voice. I can't even describe it, but you know what I'm talking about. And I had that voice in my mind day and night until the point I couldn't imagine what it, was, what it would be like not to hear that voice. And so reading Aurelius, it was like, oh, there are other, other ways to think. That was, that was literally it. There's just, there's another option. Yeah, I, I, I started to read, I, started, I stopped watching TV shows in lockdown and I started to read uh, fin de siècle literature from Vienna, like Schnitzler and Hoffmann's right. for the, I think, for anything the, will do it. It's yeah, just but to remind you it that it felt like more remote from what was right. going on than anything else I right. could find. Um, we, I, I have to add, you don't have a smartphone, which I'm endlessly impressed by, because you that's actually like saying manage you don't to, take heroin. I'm so impressed. <laughs> it, it's not a you know, it's not a virtual moral achievement. Well, in a world where most yeah. people take heroin all the time. Yeah, I, I suppose. Yeah, I just was slow to, on the uptake, and now it's too late. Everybody's on heroin, um, but. Uh, yeah, I think anything will do. It didn't have to be a radius. It could have been anything from any other w world. Because to me, even like when we, I was talking to Hari, like politically on email, it seemed to me that without the possibility of knowing that things can be different, and that includes the language in which you have your political thoughts, mm -hmm. it's very hard to do politics. I mean, one thing we have to remember, and we kind of have half forgotten, is that the uh, all those projections about how long is this going to take in the first one or two months were wildly uh, uh, longer than it actually did take. It was, uh, the, the Imperial College said, we have to have a lockdown for three years. Yeah. 
Uh, lots of very, very uh, reasonable people said we're never going to have a vaccine. Um, we will never have the world that we, we used to live in. So uh, it, it, um, it was much more dystopian than we actually right. remember now. Because right. I, that's another thing that I, I found in our emails from back then, that Imperial College projection, which of course shocked me to no end, uh, that was quickly forgotten by everyone. Right. It was also wrong, obviously. But. <laughs> Everything felt like it was quickly forgotten. I, I felt personally that Though I know in Germany you tend to um, give a lot of credence to the idea of, of writers being useful. <laughs> in, in, in my case, I, I, don't, I, I knew I had no hope of understanding the science and the, the politics seemed to me transforming moment by moment. When I was reading Marcus Aurelius, I was thinking, here is a man who is interested in, it's a very old-fashioned word, I can't think of a better one, but the, the soul of himself and the soul of whoever was reading this material, and that's mm -hmm. really what I was thinking of when I was writing, that man is obviously a political animal and a animal of contingency and an animal of time, but also there must still be a part of man or woman uh, away from this public voice. There must be still a private person. And is it possible to speak to that person still? Is there a language in which you could reach them before they wake up in the morning, before they pick up the phone, before they engage with this collective mm -hmm voice, can I still find a way to speak to them intimately? And uh, it, it's, it's hard, because it, you have to try and find a language which doesn't, um, isn't shared by that, that uni voice. Because the moment the words are used that people see every morning, then they come with their particular arguments, the debates that are connected to yeah. those terms. And so trying to find a language that is um, intimate, where I can speak to them directly before all those uh, discourses, whatever they may be, appear. That's kind of what I wanted to do, ju just for myself as well, to remember that uh, that daily news doesn't wholly describe my life or my existence or anybody's. That's why your book actually doesn't make any arguments, because that uh, argument in the sense of putting forward a thesis and then proving it or trying to prove it or trying. No. It's, I, I it's really intimations. It's, it's, it's pondering the situation in a very slow, beautiful, and um, non, um, non-aggressive way. I mean, it, it has nothing to do with what was actually going on in my daily phone calls. Like, I, in my daily phone calls, I was exactly that person trying to argue argue day and night. I was arguing with everyone in my family. I was trying to convince them to get a vaccine. I was marshalling all my but was facts. Late. I was that taking was my facts from yeah. you and <laughs> delivering them to my family um, exactly in that aggressive way. And, and um, anybody who had to do that, I'm sure there are people in the audience, must at some point realize the, the limitations of it and also the hypocrisy of it. It's not as if uh, I know more science than my relatives. That's a lie. I know nothing and they know nothing. But under my know nothing, I decided to submit to uh, the theory or the facts, but with no more knowledge than they had. So this like absurdist, uh, very oppressive argument I was having in which you try to humiliate your relatives mm -hmm. with science by mm -hmm. screaming at them. <laughs> um, the, the pointlessness of that just intensified month on month. But and that was a bit later because that came later, yeah. when you wrote that book, there was no vaccine. There was still the time when people said there will probably never be a vaccine or maybe but, in... But there was still the situation of belief. Like I, I was dealing yeah, with yeah, many yeah, friends yeah. and family members yeah. who didn't believe it existed. And so I, I really felt the limit of those kind of um, mm -hmm. I did, uh, arguments about things which are deeply psychological and personal and really were getting me nowhere. And I could also see that form of argumentation I could argue myself till I was blue in the face, marshalling all my Kilman facts, <laughs> and all, it, all that happened was my family got further and further away from me, personally, emotionally. So I, I, it's, it's not that I'm, I'm not that kind of arsehole, because I am, but I just could see it wasn't, it wasn't working, that it doesn't work, and that, in fact, it didn't really matter. I love these people, they're my family. We have to progress together. What is the purpose of this brutal, uh, debate. So when I started to write, I just didn't, I was having enough of that in my daily life, I think. I wanted some other, other kind of space. But I mean, that's also a bigger question, not just about the pandemic. 
uh, that we are obviously in such a divided society and the division goes through families and friends right. in many ways and we just have to learn to accept it to a certain degree. I think you can live, um, I mean the older you get, uh, the idea of opinions being the vital part of uh, humans becomes more and more absurd. <laughs> that me. Is, no, that is very true and I often feel that strongly and I feel we have to, we cannot end every discussion with someone having, if someone turns out to have a different opinion. But then I, I think if, if a friend would tell me he loves Donald Trump and if he's an American friend, he would vote for him, then I feel like I really don't want to talk no, to that I, person no, again. No, it's excruciating, <laughs> but, but you do... But maybe I, I'm narrow-minded. With, with all... With all um, I felt it's, it's particularly with some of the closest members of my family, with all my marshalling of facts, it didn't necessarily make me kinder, wiser. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it also didn't make me not do the selfish thing when I wanted to do the selfish thing. The person with all the COVID facts still goes to the party when they really want to go to the party. <laughs> These kind of little hypocrisies were everywhere, and I could feel them running right, right through me. So uh, I, I, I'm just more interested in, I don't think I'm ever an original writer particularly, I'm more interested in collective feeling, what it means to have these feelings simultaneously. Um, and it was a time of, of mass emotion, you know? People all over the world under the same condition. That, that interested me. And, the, and yet the condition that came upon them uh, manifested in so many different ways, depending on their class, their race, their economic situation, the city they were living in, trying to contain all those thoughts and still say, <coughs> we are under the same contingency. Yeah. That, that was kind of the challenge. But also letting go of opinions, that's kind of the novelist stance, right? Of, 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 a good novelist, of one's, yeah. Of a good no yeah, of yeah. course. That's what yeah. we all have to try when we are writing novels. It, it's always um, it's always a struggle, but but I I do notice like being close and loving people whose beliefs are so far from yours. Who literally well, I think of my little brother, my littlest brother, who I adore. But to him, for instance, a silly example. But star signs are for him fundamental. You know, the mm -hmm. fundamental to his relationships, to who he chooses to love, to how he thinks of him and me, or how he thinks about the world. So when you're when I'm talking to him, I'm talking to someone who literally conceives of the world in, in a completely different way. The whole world is set up in a, in a system which, I, which is meaningless to me, but was full of meaning to him. So it, to me, that doesn't make our relation impossible. There are, of course, moments where he says, you know, we just couldn't work anymore. She was a Scorpio. Where I'm like, I'm <laughs> going to kill you or myself. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's interesting. More than anything, for novelists, these things are interesting. What mm -hmm. would it be like to conceive of the world um, in this way, to think of star science as fundamental to human relations, for instance. I mean, I've, I've, I was very impressed. I studied Kafka a lot in the last year or two years because of a, 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 a lit, not lit, yeah, because of a project. You don't need an excuse to study Kafka. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a, you, no. but, uh, There were reasons, but you don't need an excuse. And it was fascinating that someone like Kafka is arguably one of the greatest. Um, he seemed to be kind of inca even incapable of having abstract opinions himself, right. which was really annoying to his friends. And which is also, it is also annoying to be friends with someone who just doesn't do the opinion thing. Right. He has, I mean, it's, it's one argument against him, right, that he has no politics. But um, he would agree. Yeah, he would agree. <laughs> his concern is existence. I think, you know. Even on that little email chain of writers, my feeling is if the world consisted only of writers who lay on the sofa wondering about existence, we'd be in serious trouble. <laughs> but luckily it doesn't. There's also Hari, there's also Katie. The, it, to me, literature is like this lake in which these tributaries mm -hmm. go in. And I'm, I'm very aware of my little tributary and what it concerns and what it doesn't concern. I think f for me, the, the trouble sometimes when I'm online is the idea of the omni writer, the person who apparently has all interests and all concerns and is able to second guess every possibility. I, I, I always imagine a writer as a much more flawed thing, concerned with their stream, usually a stream they can't help, in Kafka's case, something 
born in childhood, really, a series of psychological or political or existential concerns. And that's your job, to, just to refine it until you die. But then also, yeah, a flawed thing that strangely able to turn that flaw into something that's interesting to other people. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, I mean, I, I guess I do, I think of writing that way as a, not so much a talent as a, as a symptom. But, it, but, it's, but it's one of the nicest things you can do with, with that, that condition. <laughs> that we have. I mean, as <laughs> I love this quote, which is, isn't famous enough, by Alexander Herzen, who said, the writer is not the doctor, uh, he's the pain. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even quite know what it means, but it's completely yeah. correct. Yeah, we're definitely <laughs> the pain. Um, but the thing I noticed in a certain, it's not true, there's many different kinds of writers, but I, I guess the kind of novelists that interest me and perhaps interest you, that it's so it's so anti the the moment but yourself is is not the case that's the best way i can put it mm -hmm. you're not trying to um uh, d defend yourself or or portray yourself in a certain flattering light or even sell yourself or y yourself is kind of uh, it's not that it's un unimportant because certainly writers have egos no no doubt but to me, the self is just an object among many other things. It's interesting, but it's not overwhelmingly interesting, and mm -hmm. it's not the central case. So I think sometimes when I'm writing, like even when I was writing this, I, I, I think people have got so used to the idea that the first person voice is a kind of selling technique, like these are the things I feel, and these are my opinions, and aren't they amazing? I, I, I just don't, that's, it's more like an object of study. Like, but I mean, it's there interesting, are, but not that interesting. There are some real big ego writers who turn that into something interesting. But maybe yes. they're not novelists. Maybe they're other, like Voltaire, there are other kind of writers. I don't know. Or they know. can be like someone like Roth, where it is a kind of ego rant, but it's so, uh, so, uh, I don't know, there's so much in it that it can include other people. The novels are really just a long, yeah. delightful rant, but there's space for other people here and there. But I mean, that, that brings us to a quite famous essay you wrote, and I never asked you about this. As far as I know, maybe I didn't see it, but I think you did, didn't which is better. Oh, uh, yeah. I, which I, that long time I found ago. a very, very convincing essay, which I still quote, but I've, uh, in which you argue that the faults in a writer's personality, and obviously every human being, so also every writer has fault in their personality, that the faults in their personality will also somehow translate in the things that you can criticize about their writing. Maybe I'm something... I think I wrote it very young. It sounds incredibly moralistic, but, I, I, but, I, but what I feel <laughs> is uh, now, I think it's true, but it's, I would call that an extra literary matter. Like, it, it's not something that's really... Like I write literary but you don't criticism. think it's wrong now? You, you... But I think it's a, perso it's, something you, you, it's a personal matter. Writers know it. I yes. know perfectly well that my blind spots as a human are, are also in my writing. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Roth is a classic example. Like, uh, when you think of the failings of his writings about women, you, you can become obsessed with that as a moral issue, but... But it's also an aesthetic issue. It means mm -hmm. that the women are flat and they don't really exist in the novels. And that's a pain. It's a pain for Roth. It was a pain for Roth when he was alive. It's a pain for the reader. But it, to me, it doesn't ever completely extinguish the books because they, their blind spots are obvious. I mean, obviously, I don't go to Roth for, for a um, you know, great analysis of female life. Just as it, just like I don't, I don't go to Philip Larkin <laughs> to learn about race relations. Or Kafka but, but to learn I, about politics. Right, but if I want to know about death, then I will read Larkin. Here is a man very concerned with death. But why did you not include that essay in, a, in one of the books? I, 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 I barely, rem I barely <laughs> remember it. I, I just remember being very young writing it and also that kind of um, emphasis on morality in writing. I, you know, since I'm such a terrible old sinner myself, I find really exhausting now. <laughs> Maybe when I was 23, I thought I was going to be a good person or something. <laughs> well, that, that brings us to another topic of, of intimations, which you touch upon sev several times, which is what it feels like as a writer to be, well, not old, we're not there yet, 
but not a young, young writer anymore. And that it's actually quite cool. It is, you know, it's not, it's, it's not bad. I, I think it's one of the few professions now I look around me in which it's not so bad to get old. It, it's really, um, it, you just, you become better. You, but of course you lose the energy, like the energy of debut novels is one of the most wonderful things in our little community. But you definitely get, get better the, at, at the technical part of it. I just finished a novel, so I, I feel really, um, the joy of competency, that's the best way I can put it. And it's wonderful to be competent, it takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but then just at the moment you become competent, you become irrelevant, it's a shame. It's a terrible, <laughs> terrible combination of time and skill. Um, but, but maybe mid 40s is a lovely sweet spot. I'm, I'm really, I've never been happy finishing a novel for the first time in my life. I am, and I, and I remember when you finished Till, you were happy I was really for the happy, first yeah. time. Yeah. And so maybe that, that's what it's for. I remember I, we, we, we had dinner in, in that Chinese place the same evening I finished yeah. it. And I remember I, I told you, I finished this novel, and you said something I'll never forget. You said, oh, what a shame. It could have been such a great, endless joke to your friends <laughs> that you never finished that book. <laughs> I <think laughs> Which is so never true. Finish it. I did think you'd never finished it. And I, I remember watching you thinking, I. This is a reason never to write a historical novel. Look what he's going through. It's a hell on earth. He'd be in the playground, like listening to a whatever sure. six-volume medieval history <laughs> while Oscar ran about. I was like, no. Um, but then, uh, then I, then I did, did it. it. And yeah. one of the reasons I did it is something you said to me because I always thought I couldn't possibly write a historical novel. It's too much work, and I just can't. And you'd said something about. <laughs> about a horse ride. You said yes. at some point I was trying to work out how long it takes a carriage to get from, I don't know, Berlin to Dresden. And I asked 15 different academics and they all came back with different answers. And I decided, just say the carriage goes from Berlin to Dresden. And that was the, the solution in my mind. Stop worrying about this ridiculous uh, minute detail. And it was really the most freeing thing. Sometimes you just need something like that. No, it was, it was even, it was even <laughs> funnier because I, I, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with this story, but it's, I, I actually am going to bore you with the story. <laughs> uh, I, when I started measuring the world, the first chapter, actually on the second page, Gauss goes from uh, Göttingen to Berlin, yeah, and I tried yeah. to figure out how long uh, does it take. And actually, someone put me in touch with the leading historian of transport in the Göttingen area. <laughs> And I asked him, and he wrote me a lengthy email saying it could have been like this, it could have been like this. It could not have been less than three days. That is not possible with the transport of the... In the and, and then, I, a week later or so, I got a book very hard to get, the um, letters exchanged between Humboldt and Gauss, which is hmm. uh, very few copies of that was printed because it's just uh, 19th century science. And from that, it, I actually learned that it was only two days. He right. was so, and that they freed me up so much. That made me so happy. I've, not because I felt like it, it doesn't matter, but I felt like no one really knows yeah. the details about everyday life. And I, I talked to a much many years later. Um, I talked to a great, very famous historian about 17th century who had written a biography of uh, Charles V. And so he was, he's, I mean, I don't know whether he's the, the leading expert on Charles V, but he's certainly up there with two or three other people. And the biography is very long. And he said, but there's still one question I cannot answer. And I said, what is that? And he said, the question is, what the hell did Charles V do all day? <laughs> <laughs> With these that's wonderful, not in yeah. the, that's not in the old. No, um, in these gaps things. in history, <laughs> novels enter, and it's yeah. really <laughs> so joyful. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, talking about historical writing, if one thing that really it helped me write historical novels also helped me to deal with the present in the sense that it teaches yeah. you to look at the pre at the weirdness of the present as if from the future. Yeah. And um, when I look at the story of COVID, I think there, I'm always wondering how are they going to tell that story? And I think there are two competing stories. And one 
maybe disagree, but um, one story here would be a great story of human ingenuity. Mm. We had a terrible disease, uh, and for the first time in human history, we got an incredibly efficient vaccine in basically just a few months' time, and uh, we can be really proud of ourselves it's as a species. It's definitely not going to be that story, but carry on. It's not wrong. <laughs> no, it's not wrong, it's not but wrong. there's no way and that's And the story. other story at the it's same delightful. time yeah. would be a story of absolute idiocy. The yeah. idiocy of crowds, one third of people, uh, in Austria actually one half of people, in, other, in all other countries one third, not wanting that vaccine, but also the idiocy of governments. And, and, and listen to this, and we talked about this, and I cannot get over some of these things, especially because they're so ridiculous. In planes above Italy, you were not allowed until last year to put a jacket in the overhead locker because yeah. of COVID. In Berlin airport, uh, one year after the lockdown, you were still not allowed two pieces of hand luggage, even if you booked two pieces of hand luggage because of COVID. Uh, in the UK, until last summer, you were only considered vaccinated if your vaccination had been administered inside of the UK. Yeah, that's correct. Even yeah. as a British citizen. We're very British nationalist citizen. even about vaccines here. If you got it outside. Then in Germany, for example, vaccines. you were considered unvaccinated. That's correct. But the vaccine was German. <laughs> I, 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 look. <laughs> I could go on and on. I have I, some more examples if you want to, but the, the thing, I, I think you got my point. Oh, I, I, I give you one more. I give you one more. Sorry. On. Sorry. In Colombia, <laughs> they, they had hundreds of people disinfecting car tires oh. at traffic lights. Yeah. Okay, that's it. That's it. I have more, but that's it. I th I so think my question is, which of the two stories is it going to be? <laughs> I, I think the, the one thing that maybe novelists know is that there's no perfectibility in human affairs. So. One of the things I noticed writing this Victorian novel is that much of this has happened before. So I, yeah. I, I'm not writing about plagues, but I couldn't help. I'm in the 1850s in London, and anti-smallpox vaccine arguments were everywhere, mm -hmm. and they were exactly the same. Some of the statements are the same. Parents on the street with the same signs, don't touch our children. That was a, a quote from the 1850s in London, and for the same reason, these shadowy elites, rich people giving our children vaccines, we don't know what's in them. So th these are human instincts that you can't correct human instincts. They're, they're profound and deep, and there are reasons for them. They're not completely rational. Just in the 1850s, poor people in London had reason to suspect their children were being manipulated and destroyed by an elite that didn't care anything for them. This is a reasonable emotion, perhaps in the wrong place. So I don't see it as um, a unique case of idiocy. I see a kind of cyclic movement in human business. And what you're hoping for as it goes round and round, is that certain further edges of error are never made again. So you're imagining that yeah. as the will goes round, things like slavery don't return. The liberal belief is that the circle gets smaller and smaller, but as we've seen in America, certain things that you thought could never return, yes. return. So it seems impossible that women will once again have their right to abortion curtailed, and then here we go again. So I, I have a... I don't think it's an unhealthy pessimism, but an awareness, particularly as you look along the longer uh, time period, that these circles uh, get smaller and bigger, and that you have to be um, alert and not imagine that certain social compacts made will last forever. They but, don't last forever. But then also, I do notice that my British friends are much more relaxed about government idiocy because somehow you don't expect to be governed by no, but, intelligent but here, but people, whereas we still kind of do yeah, But over here, here we're from different, uh, I mean, we <laughs> noticed that between us in the, in the beginning of the, I'm a child of government, yeah. I was born in government care, government, uh, e even an English government to me is, uh, the nanny state, as they call it in England, to me is, is a, has a ring of beauty about it. Mm -hmm. Everything that occurred in a nanny state allowed my life to, to be. So. Uh, I don't have that fear of government overreach because government overreach uh, it was my life, it is my life. It's, it created the possibility of my life. So immediately, even uh, on our little email chain, we felt the difference between the Americans, mm -hmm. the German technocrats, and That's the English. Me. That would be me. Yeah, and, and the English who, who basically, uh, I hope for the best and, exp mm -hmm. and expect that things will basically be okay, hopefully. Um, so. Uh, I don't, I don't have that um, fear of government overreach. Uh, the reach as far as it goes um, is always fine with me because the people 
it, it is there to uh, uh, protect. I, I was one of them. But yes, the deep incompetence, you know, I can't, I can't deny it. And I'm, I'm about to, it has already happened, in fact, two days ago, the replacement of one kind of state with a, a voracious one, which I also remember from childhood. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, we can get talking about COVID and the crisis. We can't get around the darkest topic of, of, of these days, of course. I mean, in a way, the world obviously didn't end and our old lives continued, sort of. But, but now, something was deeply changed, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, at every level. On every level, exactly. And, and that, that, that's what I mean. And then also, there is a war now, and it feels like that somehow, I mean, well, also because, of course, Putin somehow did something to his mind, apparently, uh, the, the, the isolation. But it feels like we do live in a very different, darker world now where everything is possible. Or you don't, do you feel like that? I'm sure you do. I do, I do feel like that, but I also feel this um, renewed energy in the local. I don't know how it is in Germany, but I notice in myself and um, in the streets of London a real concern with local existence, in what's happening in your local school, in your streets, in your community, in trying to make that neighborhood by neighborhood livable. And, uh, that to me is um, one, I don't know, silver lining of COVID. This realization that your life is not, um, you know, an untethered liberal go globalist phenomena where you just fly from town to town and, and your town square is on the internet. No, your, your real life is right in front of you. It's the people in your house, it's your children, it's your neighbors, it's the local park, it's the local school. I feel this kind of energized attention to that locality. And, and that, I find that exciting. But the fact that you feel like that, it must have something to do with the fact that you returned to London. Yes. So yes. I, I asked you this before, but uh, this is your um, Goodbye to America book in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 had, a, I had a great time in New York, but um, all the things, I mean, I'm sure you were here rich people talking about how awful New York is right now. I'm sure I, I have said things like that, but the truth is uh, those things that seem to shock people when they're now there now, people brunching and people laid out on meth in the street, they were always there. It was always like that. It is worse, but it was always like that. And I feel a kind of like retrospective shame. Uh, that's the best way I can put it, really. And, and how, how much in New York, particularly in Manhattan, um, you learn to tolerate as if it were normal. Would you have left without COVID? I mean, I remember you wrote a beautiful farewell essay in the New York Review of Books one or two years before, but it still felt like a playful I don't farewell. know if I would have left. Yeah. I don't know. You need... Um, it's like a merry-go-round. You need to have the guts to get off. And uh, as we've established, heroin is very addictive in whatever form it comes in. Phone, pleasure, streets of Manhattan. I don't know if I would have left. I'm glad that um, my hand was forced. I'm very, very glad to be home. Would you have written a Victorian novel if you... St no, and yeah. that was also, you know, when I went to New York at uh, 24, if you give me the reason, one of the reasons was, I don't want to be one of these goddamn middle-aged English novelists who writes a Victorian novel. <laughs> that was genuinely, like, one of the inspirations for getting on a plane. So it, it's, like, deeply, <laughs> deeply ironic I came back and did it. But, um, <laughs> but I've, really, I've really loved doing it and, um, and finding, a, in my I hope, a new way to do it. Um, and I, I think, I, I love New York, but, but I was getting deracinated out of existence. To me, writers are also local beings. And um, for me, it's been very, uh, it's just incredibly nutritious to be mm -hmm. home, to hear English voices of all kinds, of all classes, of all races, to be back in my uh, world. So you live, you live in the neighborhood where you grew up in? I live on the street yeah. I was born on. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, that's a little depressing at times. It can be. <laughs> but, um, but my, you know, my family all around me, all my old friends, um, there's something wonderful about it as well. And also remembering that this is the way that, for, as you know, for hundreds and hundreds of, hundreds of years, everybody lived. You lived where you were born, in the community you came from, you lived and died there. Without going to New York for years, Without going to years, New York meanwhile. for 10 years. Yeah. Um, so that, it's just an interesting mindset for me. I, I'm always interested in things on a human scale because I know that the world has transformed, the phone in your pocket has transformed everything, but the brain itself is still the same old brain mm. with slight, small developments, but it's still this human brain. And it can only take so much. <laughs> I'm always trying to bring things back in my writing into a human scale, something that is, that is uh, worthy of a human and relevant for humans and not for machines. So um, p being home is, is partly that, writing like a human again and being a human again, hopefully. That seems like a good moment to ask you whether you have any questions. There's a microphone somewhere if someone has has a question. I was told. <laughs> Anyone? You can. There's the microphone. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, actually, I wanted to ask a question. When you were living in New York City, did you um, feel this comeback of locality as well as in London? I, I mean, Greenwich Village is a neighborhood. It, it is a neighborhood. And it has a beautiful history as a kind of bohemian neighborhood. My street is where the first Af all African American theater was, just on the corner of Mercer and Broadway um, in the late 19th century, for example. So it was a, a black neighborhood for a while. When Dickens visited, that's what he saw, which is uh, hard to imagine. Then it became Italian. Um, and then it has this wonderful reputation of writers and artists. And, um, and now I guess it's NYU, right? <laughs> it's NYU, Russian oligarchs and movie stars. So that's a different kind of community. Um, but uh, it was always interesting. Like, I mean, when I first moved, it was, uh, you know, anthropologically, it's fascinating. I mean, you, you know it as well as I do. It's, it's unbelievable walking down the street and bumping into it's the most artists exciting everywhere you go. It's the most exciting thing ever. Yeah, it's incredibly exciting. Um, so, but I. But it's unreal. It's, it's an unreal unreal it's excitement unreal. somehow. Yeah. But it's it's great. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I, I am, uh, you know, far from a monk. And when I finish writing, I love to go and have a martini, and I love to go dancing, and I love to have fun. And it was a good place to do all those things, basically. Um, I, I see. I. I can't really see very well if, and because of the lights, so, but maybe the uh, people with the microphones can see if someone raised, there, there's just definitely someone raising their hand. <laughs> hmm, there you go. Thank hey. you, hi. I actually have a question for both of you, and I wanted to know whether you always knew that you wanted to become writers. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I would. I, li I liked. I liked singing. I would have. I mean, I liked that kind of thing. But I, I think pretty early on, I, I wanted to be a writer from about twelve. I'd say. Yeah, very early on, it's, it's the, the, the same. Might, might have something to do with the fact that we both started publishing very early. So there are some people who developed that urge much later in life, but that wasn't us. Um, I remember uh, I was, oh, I don't know, maybe 11 or 12 when my German teacher took one of my little, um, I don't offset, I don't know how, and, and put it in the school magazine. And I felt like, this is so cool. <laughs> I love that. And, and, uh, and then a few years later, a, a friend of my, a close friend of my father 
was a guy who's now more or less forgotten, uh, Fritz Eckert, who was in Austria a very, very popular um, actor, but also someone who wrote lots of comedies, like, like for TV, like for like like very. He, they asked him to write something funny for TV. He sat down, he wrote it in two days, and some actors did it very fast. And uh, he was usually playing in it. And he asked me, I was like 15 or 16. He asked me, "What do you want to do in life?" And I said. And, and I'd say, I had said that before, but I said, I would really like to be a writer, if pos at all possible. And I felt like he will start laughing at me. And he said, without missing a beat, he said, that's great. You make good money and you don't have a boss. <laughs> and I have to say, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 but I, I do think, I mean, I'm speaking for Daniel, but I, I remember first meeting you and I think the first identification is, is as a reader. I remember when yeah. we first met, we talked about books and yeah. and that that is my primary. I mean, I, I do love writing, but finishing this novel and realizing that I now have like a year maybe before I have to publish it and I can just read is, is really, that's, so that's the sweet spot. I mean, you, you, you only seriously consider becoming a writer because you love books or yeah. stories. No, not, Maybe not books, but stories. stories. In, in, and I feel, I mean, you, you have taught students for many years, um, so you know that much better. But I feel like there, it's a bit problematic that these days some people, not, I'm not saying your students, I don't know them, but some people want to be writers without actually uh, being that interested in books. It's more like a general idea of going to festivals and... I did meet a, a poet recently who said to me, I would like to write a novel. And I said, oh, what do you like to read? Which is what I always ask. She said, I, I don't think I've ever read one. And I said, but why do you want to write a novel? And she said, I like the idea of it being long. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I don't know how common that is, but I was a little, a little bit shocked. Yeah, your reading is key, key part of the job, yeah. <laughs> Necessary. There's a, there's a question there. Hey. Hi, hello. Do I have to? Oh, okay. Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, Ms. Smith, could you tell us a little bit what it was like um, for you writing the theatre play in terms of uh, the difference to writing the novel? You finish the novel, that's it, it's finished, and you finish the play, and then it starts with the director and the actor right. and so forth as well. And the second question, you're free to answer with the yes or no, and that is, do you write poetry? Oh my god, I, the second one I can answer very quickly, no, ever, never. <laughs> and um, by the way, thank you for the question. I had it somewhere on there, but I didn't get no. to it, so thank you very much. No. <laughs> I wanted to ask that too. No, my husband writes poetry. I don't write any poetry ever. Um, the play, um, I mean, it was a translation, so it, it's the, the Wife of Bath by Chaucer, but it's called The Wife of Wilsden, and The Wife of Bath, in my case, is a Jamaican woman in her late 50s. Alvita, um, and it was unbelievable fun to write. It's got a lot of different, because she has five husbands, and in my version, she's, I think she's married to, what's she got? She's, got a, she's married to a Jamaican, a Rasta, a young boy, a, uh, an old Englishman. There's, a, there's five husbands, I can't remember all of them now, but with lots of different voices. And so writing was very, you know, amusing, typing, doing all the voices, making myself laugh. And then, uh, but then in, in the rehearsal room when Claire Perkins, who's the actress, playing this um, extraordinary Jamaican, British, like power, powerful woman, uh, it was beyond anything I could have imagined really. Like I really, um, I, I'm such a repressed really and controlled person and I didn't wanna, I wanted to write the play and I didn't wanna have anything else to do with it. Like I didn't wanna go in, I didn't wanna meet any actors, I didn't wanna see any rehearsals. So I was kind of dragged into it, and then I kind of sat there like that, very stiff, and, and watching the actors, how easy they are with each other, even when they've just met, you know, how physically unembarrassed. But for the first two weeks, I thought, these people are mentally ill, and they really should all get help. <laughs> and then a few weeks in, I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm the one with the serious problem. These people are happy. 
and uh, having a good time and uh, open to the world and interesting and unashamed and it was so uh, humbling and also th I guess I thought that acting was just doing the voices which is what I do um, so I thought I can play all these roles what's the big deal here and then you see the actors you're like oh no it's like embodying something actually they actually do that taking yeah, yeah. a risk and laying not just it, impersonating yeah. people like being that person mm -hmm and putting it all out there. And, and Claire is an unbelievable actress. We're going to New York with it in, in um, the spring, and I, I, I hope maybe we'll get to Germany, but to see her, you know, it's basically a one-woman play almost in her little red dress, like stalking around this stage, um, just embodying the spirit. If you know any Jamaican women in Northwest London, then you'll know the energy <laughs> that they bring. And she just has it. I couldn't have even imagined what she did to that role when I was sitting typing, thinking, this is funny, translating short. <laughs> so uh, uh, it really, um, it, it was a wonderful experience to see what artists, actors are, which I don't think I really understood until I was watching it. Are you going to do more plays? Is a natural question now. I have, I have one a little bit in mind, and I, I might give it a go. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about it. We'll see. Yeah. I think, uh, I think over there, yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do you have to, like, yeah, the, the, the I, I only see the hand. I'm, I'm, I need my glasses to direct Sorry, the microphone. Sorry, I actually have a mic over here. Here. Uh, right there, yeah, right in front yeah, this, of this. I'm on the other side. Oh, yeah, who? I think. You, de you, you decide, you have your oh, um, eyes, you, see, you can see it. I'm actually over here oh. with the mic that's on. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> oh, I am wait. taking out my glasses I can't glasses see anything. I we'll go on the other side. I'm just going to listen. I don't know where you are, but carry on. It's yeah. really yes, like we have kind of, we, see, we have a haze of, of light up here. Glasses so we can't really on. direct the microphone. So. Okay. Yeah, the, the glasses don't really help. Yeah. Excellent. So I just wanted to ask, in my reflections on the book and during 2020, I was thinking a lot about hope. And I would love to know how you approached the feeling of hope during this period of time. We talked a lot about arguments and feelings of sadness. I just, I don't, I don't think I can talk about hope because I, I was the least, um, <laughs> I just crumbled immediately. I, w I didn't have any, I know other people who really were able to keep going and they held their families together and they went to the supermarket in hazmat gear and they did all that stuff. I, I just collapsed. I had like a mental collapse. I could not deal with it at all. So it, it was the, really the first time in my life, the writing, I guess that's a version of hope, right? Like I, my husband gave me some time to go down into this basement room and write for about four hours a day and then we'd swap because we were homeschooling. And in those uh, four hours, I don't know if it was hope exactly, but I just, I had something else to focus on. And I knew that, that it was a book that was going to make money for the situation. So that became like, well, at least you're doing something. At least it's kind of, you have some focused activity. Um, but I wasn't able to kind of muster general hope. But I think after the fact, I can only speak personally, but seeing what it did to my relations with my, the people close to me, that did give me a bit of hope. I, it was like I rejoined the the real for a moment. Like it just felt like coming out of the matrix for a moment, really looking at what's in front of you, whatever it is, my mother, my children, my brothers. It was like an incredibly focusing thing. This is real, these people are real. This is my real life, not whatever went up online in the past five minutes. This is what matters, this street, these people. So knowing what it did inside me, I guess if I writerly wise, hope and imagine something like it happened to other people. Even the miseries, like my husband's father died of COVID. So there were terrible, terrible moments. But all, all those um, uh, confrontations with reality did, did something, the, the result of which for me at least seemed positive in the long term. And I can only hope that, that something like that happened for other people. I think we can do one more question and then I would... There's a lady over here who's been, yeah. yeah. Is it, 
Oh, yes. Oh, you have um, more. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> um, my question is regarding um, the revelation that you had while you were in isolation about people's mentality. How do you deal with that now and think about it now that we're no longer in isolation, but that aspect remains the same? I, I just, um, you know, I feel most alienated and most when I think, because uh, everybody's a cyborg, which doesn't have to necessarily be a bad thing, but everyone is a cyborg, right? So you, a lot of your memory and life and everything is on this phone. When I think, you know, when I'm sometimes sat in front of someone and they only speak the language of the, you know, it's fully, the discourse is fully embodied and I can sometimes think, uh, you know, just give it up. That this is what people want. This is that they like it. They love it. This is them. Just get over it. Like, these are new kinds of people. It's a new... And so when I think that, I think, oh, okay. So it's just, there's a new kind of human. But I think during COVID, I, I really felt that everybody's still in there. They're still, I'm still, they're all human, they're still there, absolutely still there. I saw it in my students, I saw it in my family, they're still human beings, they can still be accessed, you can still talk to them, you just have to be very creative about it. I think about it like a duck on water, like the, the legs have to go twice the speed. That's how I felt with my students, that all these people are in pain, they're in pain, it's a, they're scared, like the environment is a disaster, politically it's possible, social, there's, there's so much fear and suffering and you, you can't, there's no point in attacking people's opinions or ideas, they're in need and I'm also in need, so that's the point of connection and the generational gap or whatever it is, that's, that happens to every generation. The same arguments happened in the 60s and the 1890s and the 1840s, that's life, there's always a generation gap, but this kind of connection of, of pure need, um, that, that makes me feel better. Because when I know someone is still a human and that sometimes this daily thing is too much for them because they still have their human-sized brain, then I know that I'm, I'm, we're still in the same reality. We're still t we can talk. Despite miscommunications, we can still communicate. <laughs> So, can I ask you to, the, the last essay in here is actually called Intimations, like the book, and there is, and, and, and has then the, the subtitle, that, is it a sub, is it, I mean, it's a subtitle, yeah. that's in lessons, yeah. or, yeah. So, uh, and uh, there you name several people and things and writers and family and who, are, who gave you de who, to whom you owe debts and who gave you lessons. And the last one, which is also the end of the book, is called Contingency. Mm. And could I ask you just to, to uh, wrap this up, yeah. uh, to read the mini, the little sub, -S min sub or mini essay, part of the essay, sure. Contingency. Um, I do want to say just before I read it, that after I wrote it, sometimes people would write to me and say, uh, I don't understand why you wrote just a list of good things that happened to you. <laughs> I was like, I, I felt I really needed to explain that, I mean, partly reading Till, and I've always felt as a child that to say it is unbelievably lucky to be born in 1975 <laughs> is not, is not a, a statement of a privilege. If, if you know history, it doesn't, also, it doesn't also mean your life is perfect, but I know, particularly as a black woman, if I'm born in 1320, if I'm born in 1875, if I'm born in 1920, this is a very different existence. So I'm always aware of this historical luck, despite all its complications. To me, not to recognize it is to kind of spit on the grave of your ancestors, not to realize um, a fundamental difference. Um, so this was, you know, me feeling at my most self-pitying, remembering there are, there are also reasons why I am fortunate. Um, contingency. Uh, that I was born when I was born, where I was born, a case of relative historical luck. That I grew up in a moment of social, religious, and national transition. That my school still sang the Anglican hymns, at least for a little while, so that the ancient diction of my country came to me while very young and fruitfully mixed with the sounds of my heritage that the tail end of one thing and the beginning of another were both visible and equally interesting to me. Milton and Moni Love. 
Hill and gully rider, hill and gully. Keats and Monty Python. And did those feet in ancient time. Kafka and Prince. Yellow bird up high in banana tree. Twelfth Night and Desmond's. Malcolm X and Anurin Bevan. Oscar Wilde and James Baldwin. Pump up the jam. Peter Cook and Tupac. Queen Latifah and Vita Sackville West. That there were so many voices in the streets, that such complex convergences were my earliest knowledge of the world. That no one interfered with me sexually as a child. That my father was dull and steady and did not drink due to a weak kidney. That my own love of alcohol and all forms of mood transformers and enhancers for some reason never became excessive that my mother had no hatred for her own skin, hair, nose, backside, nor any part of her, that my family was essentially matriarchal, that I was considered ugly, young, and beautiful later, that by the time the external opinion changed, it was too late to create any real change in me, <laughs> that the kinds of women I admired in childhood were all from what Tony Cade Bambara called the championship tradition, Nana, George Eliot, Madonna, Catherine Hepburn, Grace Jones, Salt, Pepper, Lil' Kim, Joan Armour Trading, Angela Davis, Elizabeth I. That my fear is stronger than my desire, including my desire to self-harm. That my grandfathers, one a violent alcoholic, the other a destroyer of women, were both unknown to me. That my brothers were a delight to me from the first that I was an oldest child with all the shameful obliviousness that implies, that I met a human whose love has allowed me not to apply for love too often through my work, even when we've hurt each other desperately, that my children know the truth about me but still tolerate me so far, that my physical and moral cowardice have never really been tested until now. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So the reason why we didn't use this beautiful applause to leave the stage, <laughs> which you all expected, is because we were told to stay here and sign books if you have any. That's why we're still here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>